Well, good morning, church. It's great to see you all today. If you'd please stand and we'll worship our Lord Jesus together. seated. Hey church, it's great to have all of you with us today. Ladies, the next Women's Fellowship Night will be an evening of joy on December 14th from 6 to 8 p.m. Child care will be provided. Just make sure you sign up ahead of time at lscc.tv. And join us as we celebrate the birth of Jesus during our Christmas Eve service at 4 p.m., both in person and online. If you're looking for prayer or another way to get more involved, Fill out the connection card on the seat in front of you or head to lscc.tv connect to fill it out online. As we continue on our mission to love God, love others, and be the church, we need your support. If you call LSCC home, consider contributing financially. You can safely and securely make a one-time gift or set up recurring giving by going to lscc.tv give. Or if you'd rather give in person, you can use the black boxes at each of the auditorium exits. And now, let's say hey to Chris as we continue our series, Foundations. <laughs> hey, guys. Someone called me Kojak earlier. I didn't know who that was, so I had to look it up. 
That's what they said. Is that, isn't that the same person? Oh, all bald people look the same. <laughs> um, doesn't it look good around here? Looks nice. I just want to give a, a shout out, a special thanks to everybody who's kind of, um, we had some people in all week and they were decorating all week and so it looks, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas around here. Um, and that reminds me, there's a table back here and um, there's a women's event <clears throat> for Christmas and the men are going to dress up nice and they're going to serve uh, the women and so you can sign up for that in the lobby back there on your way out. Uh, before we jump in, I want to do a quick review of where we've been before in the sermon series. The last two weeks, we've been talking about the Christian cuss word of submission. And when we hear that word submit outside of the church, we usually go, oh, that's not, that's not a good word. I don't, I don't like that word. Um, and so the first sermon when Corey uh, first brought this um, sermon and kind of went over submission, uh, an important thing there to understand, it's willing, it's willful. Um, we are not called to subjugate people against their will. That is not how Jesus deals with us. That is not what submission means. That's an abusive form of submission. Um, but we are called to submit, and Paul takes us through um, submission in these different relationships in our life. Um, and so we learned last week that leadership wasn't just a top-down structure where I, as a subordinate, just submit to everything a supervisor says, or that I, as a supervisor, just do whatever I want with somebody because I'm in authority. That's not a top-down structure that you would think. Um, in the Bible, we see something more like this, where when I'm in a subordinate role, I submit myself to Jesus first. And then who Jesus is and the gospel and all that then characterizes the way I am as a subordinate. Or if I'm a supervisor, then I would submit myself to Jesus first in that role and not just do whatever I want in any way I want, but I would submit myself to God and then lead the way that Christ leads, right? And that's, that's what we learned about leadership last week, and we are going to continue that idea um, now in a new relationship um, between child and parent, and next week we're going to be talking about parents in general. And um, <clears throat> so we're going we're gonna to get into this verse today, but before we do, let's bow our hearts before Jesus in prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be here today. Thank you that it is beginning to look like Christmas. Lord, I pray for warm snow, <laughs> uh, uh, 32 degrees exact in a snowy Christmas. And um, just thank you that we live in such a magical and beautiful place. Lord, I pray for Oxford High School in Lower Michigan and just everything that has transpired there, just that cruel and tragic act. Um, I, I pray that even out of that, you would bring the truth of, of your gospel and you would use all things, even that, um, to bring people to, to salvation, Lord. And I thank you for Tate Meyer. Um, and I just want to honor him, God, just a young man who would run to gunfire where everybody else was running away just displays who you are and displays the sacrificial love of your gospel. So I thank you that, that he did that in that situation. And, and Lord, I pray for peace for, for everyone there and, and teach us how to walk through those things, God. I pray for uh, <clears throat> the church across America, the church in Marquette and our church locally, that you would build us up and, and set a firm foundation of, of who you are and Holy Spirit, just use us and bring us out to our communities um, to, to preach your gospel. And Lord, I, I pray for our nation, for our leaders in the nation, whether they would submit themselves to you or not, that, that your Holy Spirit would guide them and lead them into um, places that promote life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Lord, I pray that today is not just another sermon, it's not just uh, some songs and just an activity that we do. I, I pray that you, God, who spoke everything into creation, would speak to us today. It would be a moment where the finite meets the infinite and that, that we would know that we heard you speak and we walked away refreshed and new and changed and on mission for the things that you would have us do. Lord, I pray that for each one in the room today. It is in your powerful and precious name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. 
So the relationship we're walking in today or we're looking at today is the relationship of parent and child. And I have six children and one wife. And a lot of people, when they hear that and they meet me, uh, six children is a lot outside of Houghton. <laughs> right? And up in Houghton, it's like, ah, you just started. But outside of Houghton, people will go, man, six kids. Six. Do you know how that happens? And they'll ask me. That, I, I get that a lot. People say, six kids, do you know how that happens? And I am now then in a precarious moment because I am a little bit sarcastic and I'm unsure what to do. So I, I, I use the same phrase all the time when I get asked that question. They say, do you know how that happens? And I say, no. Could you please tell me? <laughs> but we all know how that happens, don't we? We all know how children are made, and we are all a child. Every one of us is a product of this one flesh, the Bible says, that, that marriage is. And so it is, it is fun to preach a sermon that hits everybody in the room because everybody here is a child of some body. Well, two people, really. <laughs> Unless you were made in a Petri dish, but I don't think anybody was. The interesting thing about... Um, about being a child is that we get um, our genetic code, our physical attributes and stuff from, from our parents, and then there's also spiritual things that come along with that. I, I find fascinating um, that a child leaves a biological imprint on their mother for life. Um, she now carries the cells of a new organism in her body. During pregnancy, some of the fetus cells leave the womb, traveling through the placenta, and into the mother's bloodstream where they end up in various parts of her body, including the bone. And so the mom will always carry that child in her body. When Adam was breathed into existence, God took the dust and he breathed out life and Adam was made. And then he takes the rib and he breathes out life and Eve was made. And when Eve was made, Adam said, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And the two became one flesh. And in their one fleshness, the two have this relationship and they literally have one flesh now with a child that they make and it's just fascinating to me that mom carries that around her whole life just what an honor that is what a what a crazy reality that is and see God puts us in all these relationships in our life to display who he is and what his gospel means like God could have set all this up any way he wanted it didn't just like happen he made marriage, and he made you a child, and you to have parents, and he made your relationships with your siblings. Jesus is called our brother in Scripture, and we learn from those relationships. He, he gave us each other as friends and brothers and sisters to learn more about who he is and about his gospel and what that all means to us. And today we're going to find out what it means to be a child, how this displays who God is and what the gospel is. And in our three verses today, we're looking at we're going to see that being a child is about obedience and honor, and that comes with a promise. If we get into the scripture here, it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first command with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. The first thing here is that we are called into obedience, Obedience. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And I don't know about you, but I do not like that word obey. It's a four letter word, isn't it? Obey. I like better obey what I want. I like better obey what I see fit. There's got to be some kind of caveat there. Obey your parents. What does that mean? Mean well in the language. It's hypo okua in that first that the last part of that word okua means to hear, and that first part of that word means like a military to do. It means to hear and to do. Obey. It kind of goes against everything <laughs> in me. You know, I have six children, and some people have told me about these fairy children that they just always kind of do the right thing and they just always obey and they just hear and they do. And I have six and I'm sure that 
those children are out there, but I've never met one of them <laughs> in my whole life. We all have this nature that wants to rebel. And for me, I learned this hear and do um, obey obedience in the military. See, I was a high school dropout, and no one was going to tell me what to do, and I did what I wanted, um, when I wanted, how I wanted, and that landed me um, not being able to graduate at 17, dropping out, and in some trouble with the law, and so I thought, ooh, I think I can get out of this, and so I called all the military branches, and they all have standards except for the army, and so the army took me, and um, they sent me to basic combat training, and the first two weeks is in processing. It hasn't really started yet. So you go to this in processing center, and they're kind of nice to you. Like, there's some drill sergeants, but they're not, they're not that mean. And so you get, uh, you know, you, you, you give them all of your personal items that you can have a Bible and whatever else they give you. And they in process, and you do some paperwork, and you get some shots, and you just get ready for however long that takes to get into the, the nine-week program. And when you go into this nine-week program, that's basic combat training, they put you in a line, and they shave your head bald, and they take away all your dignity. And then they put you in a cattle car like an animal. And you're riding around for an hour or two, however long they see fit. I don't know what they do. And then they, you get out of this cattle car, and they do something called their shark attack. And the shark attack is, for the first three days, I think depending on how much time, the extra time the drill sergeants in other places have, for the first three days, there are, seems like, more drill sergeants than privates. And so you get off this cattle car with your new haircut, and one person yells at you, and they say, get out and do this, and, do and they had a name for me. They called me Private Ugly because I have big ears when you shave my head. <laughs> and, and one tells you one thing to do, and you're like, oh, 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 okay, and then you do that, and another one tells you something else to do or contradicts that person and tells you what to do, and someone tells you what to do, and you're just getting told what to do and what to do and what to do and what to do for about three days. And what I learned there is to obey. If I just did the last thing I heard until the next thing I heard, if I just heard and did, this process, this nine weeks would be easy for me. And I think that's all they were trying to teach me, to hear and to obey. And that's what this verse is saying. It's saying that we would obey our parents, that we would hear and that we would obey. But there's something else in here that's interesting. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Obey your parents in the Lord. And so leadership, even here, it's not just this top-down structure where it's just obey your parents in, in everything and in all things. It's obey your parents in the Lord. And so you still see this structure in the verse that Paul has been getting at the whole time, that I as a child would submit myself to the Lord. And because of my submission to the Lord and who the Lord is, then I would Obey my parents in the Lord. Submit yourselves. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, what about when parents are not in the Lord? What about when they abandon you? What about when they sin against you? What about when they abuse you? When we hear story after story after story, and if we pulled everybody in the room, I think a lot of us would ask that question next because that's not in the Lord is it I think the verse tells us how to deal with that as children and, and it shows us gives us some insight into that it says that we are called to honor and that this honoring comes with a promise honor is a forgotten word in our culture where it seems like nothing is sacred Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you. Honor literally means to hold something of high esteem, to hold it of a high value, like it's costly. That's to honor something. And many times in the Bible when this word honor is used, it actually means to do an act of honor. Like this is an action word, that I would do some act for my parent as a child of, of honor. Think about an act of honor. I think, again, uh, about the military. Think about a military honors, a, a military funeral. Who's been to a funeral where they had military honors? 
If you go to that funeral where there's military honors, they fold the flag, they drape a casket with the flag, there's guys in uniform, they do a 21 gun salute. It's, it's a special ceremony. In fact, they would honor uh, that, that person so much that um, they will, if you're buried in a military um, um, grave or, or someplace like Arlington or something like that, they would pay for all that. They, they would care for that um, forever or until the nation falls, right? They would care for that, that grave site and place flags on it in different days, and, and they would honor, honor that veteran. Now, is that for that person, or is that because of something deeper? I think it's because of something deeper, um, because you could be a veteran and you could get an honorable discharge and you could get out of the military two, three, four, five, twenty, thirty-seven years, whatever, and they are going to give you that funeral even if you were uh, a dirtbag in society the rest of your life. You could do nothing. You could be harmful towards society. There's a, there's a few things that you could do where you wouldn't get that, but really you could, you could do nothing else and you would still get that upon your death because of that position now of being a, a, a veteran with an honorable discharge, you get military honors, no matter how you live your life, except for, like I said, a few, a few things. I think that's the idea here about honor. We see that idea in scripture. Um, this week, it's like, man, how, where, where do we see someone who is being honored even though they're sinful? Where do we see someone who is walking away from the Lord that is still honored by the Lord. And we can see this in a few places in Scripture, I think most with David. Um, are you, you guys are familiar with David and Saul, right? So the nation, I'll give you a quick little backstory. The nation of Israel, they don't have a king, and they're, they're, different people are popping up to lead them, and things aren't going well for them. And they say, give us, give us a king. And so they get a guy, and this guy's name is Saul, and Saul gets anointed from the Lord, and Saul is now king. The prophet anoints Saul and he pours oil over Saul and Saul is now king and Saul brings great blessing and victory to the nation as the king. He is following God. He's doing things well in the beginning. And then Saul starts to walk away from the Lord. And he starts to do things his way instead of God's way. And he leads the nation in a direction that is away from God. And so God decides to anoint another king. While Saul is still king, God anoints a king, a young boy named David. God anoints a young boy named David while Saul is still king. David becomes a musician in Saul's court. He's a guitar player like Joe. And, <laughs> and then he also kills Goliath. And he leads the nation to victory after victory after victory. And Saul, the king, Saul becomes jealous and angry with David. And he's, he goes after David to kill David. He takes 3,000 men against David's little band called the Mighty Men. And so he pursues David on a seek and destroy mission with 3,000 3, soldiers. And that's where we pick up the story. This king is pursuing David. And on the battlefield, he goes out to relieve himself, because you still have to do that everywhere you go. So the king goes out to relieve himself in a cave. And David is in this cave with his mighty men. And that's where we pick up in Samuel 24, verse 4. The men of David, the men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day in which the Lord said to you, Behold, I am about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to do. So David is there, and he's, he's in the cave. This king that's been trying to kill him is there. He's already been anointed by God as king, and his men are saying, do it. Remember, when God told you you were going to be king, take it. This is your opportunity. This is your time. Do it now. And so David grabs his knife, and what's he do? He goes and he cuts a piece off of his his, his cloak. And he doesn't kill him. And immediately, right after David does that, it says he feels guilty. Like he didn't kill him, he just cut a piece off of his, off of his robe and he felt guilty right 
after that. In verse 5 of, of chapter 24, it says, It came about afterward that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So right away, David's like, this was dishonoring. And so David says to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, to the king, who is the Lord's anointed. To stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. He's saying, I'm not going to do that. And then he persuaded his men not to kill Saul. And then Saul leaves the cave, and David does something even crazier in my mind. Saul leaves the cave, and David runs out to the man who's trying to kill him with 3,000 men. And he says, my Lord, my Lord. And he lays on the ground prostrate before the man trying to kill him. David believed in honor. David said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. And then he quotes a proverb, as the proverb of ancients says, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness. See, David, David knew that you do not do the right thing the wrong way. God is concerned about your character and about your heart. Think about that situation, even in the promises of God. With everybody telling you that's the right thing to do, and you've already been anointed, and that you would just honor God in that situation. Man, that that shows me that David was not just honoring Saul. David David was honoring God. And because David honored God, because David believed that the Lord's ways were higher than his ways, then David in return honored Saul. And that's what we're called to do as Christians with our parents. We're called to honor them for the sake of God and not for the sake of just us. And that comes with a promise. I love scripture that comes with a promise. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. There are so many different promises in Scripture. See, the grace is free and the cross is free, and we accept that, and we, we enter into this unconditional relationship of love with God for everything he's done like he he, he's not going to leave you he's not going to forsake you but there are conditional promises in the bible see if we wait on the lord then god provides psalm 27 14 psalm 37 7 isaiah 40 31 if we trust in god then god directs us psalm 25 1 through 3 psalm 62 if we commit to god then he establishes us here's my favorite one if we delight in god he will grant us favor Do you want favor with people? Delight in the Lord, and he will grant you favor. Psalm 37, 4, Psalm 84, 11, Psalm 112, 1. If we endure, then God will reward. Galatians 6, 9, James 1, 1, 1, 12, and there's so many many others. What's this promise? If you honor your father and mother, it will go well with you, and you may live long in the land. And that calls back to when the Ten Commandments were given and and this generation had had been rescued by God and was beginning to do things God's way. And if you would honor that as a child, if you would honor your father and mother, then it would go well with you in that land, that God would bless you and that God would prosper you. And remember, as children, we're we're doing this for the sake of, of Christ. See, I have had a lot of failure as a son and as the father. So we went in the military and, you know, they shaved my head and I came back home and I was going overseas and my dad was um, really concerned about my faith before I went overseas. And I wasn't a Christian yet. And so this couple days or week or whatever that I stayed in the house, he just kept on me. I mean, he was trying to make sure I was Christian before I go overseas, you know, that's important. And he was, he was on me though. And I wasn't listening to anything he had to say. So he would talk to me about God and talk to me about God. And it's like, why are you talking to me about God, Dad? You're a sinner. It's funny how I was a Pharisee even before I was a Christian and how I fall into that so often. My my mom, um, she took me outside sometime during that week and I remember being on the balcony and I remember being 
with her. And my mom isn't the kind of woman who talks a lot. She's firm, she's strong, she has this nobility about her. And when she does correct you, you listen. And she took me out to the balcony and she said, listen, one day you're, you're going to understand that your dad doesn't need to be perfect for you to honor him. But that's about you, not him. And this is what she was talking about. And I, I've learned this through scripture and I've learned it through the Holy Spirit. And I've learned it through my own failure as a father. And I really started to understand this when I began to fail as, as, as a father. And we, we fail for so many different reasons, don't we? Sometimes we just fail out of, out of brokenness. And we all have, we all have brokenness, every, every one of us in the room. For me, the way that it would manifest itself is, you know, I was young, I was a kid, I ended up having kids, and I'd be deployed for a year, and then I would get back to normal life for like a year or two, and then you go again for another year, and then you're back to normal life for a year or two, and then you go again, and I was just trying to figure out a lot of things in my head and in my heart and, and how to reconcile some things, and at the same time, I'm, I'm a father, and um, the VA calls it chronic PTSD. I don't share this usually with anybody but friends, but I felt it pertinent to the sermon, and there was a time, and it still manifests itself in different ways, that when the boys were young, um, I, I would barricade the door, get all of my kids in the room, and then sleep um, with a weapon at the ready, and I wouldn't really sleep, and that wasn't the craziest thing. They remember that. <laughs> they remember that, and that's kind of like an adventure or something that you're really not aware of when you're that young, but you know what they are aware of is that brokenness manifests itself in anger and in rage and in shortness and in cruelty and commanding an unfair father. And I started to understand and my dad was just going through the same stuff as me. Like he was just he didn't have it figured out yet. I think as you get older you just realize you just don't have it figured out. <laughs> my dad didn't have it figured out and he was trying to figure it out and so then grace started to flow in my relationship with my father that I that I really understood what he was going through and who he was. And, and then this gospel started to be embodied in my relationship with my dad. And I thank God, I thank God that as, that, 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 that God hasn't set it up where it's like, I just honor my parents because of who they are. Because that means my kids would have to just honor me because of who I am. And I'm a complete failure in many ways. Some of you have been abandoned by your parents. And that is hard when it is the bone of your bone in the flesh of your flesh. And some of you have been abused by your parents. And some of your parents have not cared much about you. And you as a child are called to honor them. But not because of who they are, but because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because of who God is. And I would like to tell you today that <laughs> that comes with a promise. There's a promise for honoring them, not for who they are, but for who Jesus is. And I was talking to someone after second service, and they said, man, I remember my dad was this Korean War vet, and they just talked through everything, and and he, he said, you know what changed when I became a Christian and I, and I started to honor him? He said, more than just forgive, we're called to forgive, but honoring is, it, it goes a little further and it feels, it feels kind of wrong, doesn't it? It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good to honor an abuser, does it? It doesn't feel 
right. It, it, like the, the PTSD is there and, and the hurt is there and the brokenness is there. But in the midst of it, in the midst of all that pain that you may carry your whole life, there will be freedom. You'll be free of it. You have to worry about it. You'll have joy. There is an unexplainable joy as a Christian. And the reason it's unexplainable is that we have trial and we have tribulation and we have all these things that happen in, in the midst of them. It's not that they just go away. Man, that's happening and that's happening in heaven. It's that in the midst of it, we have joy. There's a peace that surpasses all understanding. That you can be in the most unpeaceful situation as a child and you can submit yourself to the Lord and you can honor your father and mother and you can have peace that surpasses all understanding in a relationship where you should have zero peace. In a time and a place where you don't feel that way, you, you just know you have it. Paul says, I know that I know that I know. And so today... Um, we're going to take communion. Can you pass it out? Can we pass it out? Yeah. Um, we usually do this in first service. We pass it out. <clears throat> and then in second service, we get it. I, I, I thought this would be a great time to pass it out. Um, because what does communion represent? The cross. Right? It's the, the blood of Jesus and the broken body of Jesus poured out for, for all of my sin. And in Corinthians, when we take communion, we are called to, like, repent. We are called to have unity in relationship as well. And so um, I'm not going to come back up. We're not going to do it together. I would just ask that. Oh, I put that in the wrong way. As you are where you are, um, before you take communion, that you would take an opportunity and you would honor your father and your mother before the Lord. No matter who they are and no matter what they've done and no matter all the things in your life that, that you would honor them. And if you had like great parents too, that, that you would just spend time thanking God for who they are and not overlooking their faults, but thanking God that he paid for them on the cross. And so Joe's gonna sing and I would just encourage you to do that and then we will, we will worship.
What a good God that we serve, that he is king over everything, all-powerful, all-righteous. He could make us just obey just because he's God. But he loves us. He's good. He gives us a choice, and we get to come to the Father who's always by our side. He will never let us down. Christ will walk with us.
That same power that raised Jesus from the grave lives in us. We have the Holy Spirit with us. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. It's been so great seeing you all here today and worshiping our Lord and Savior. As you go out, remember to love God, love others, and to be the church. I'll see you next week.